We're beginning a brand new series today. Now, we just got done with one. Failure is the back door to success. Failure is the back door to success. I want to begin another series today, and it's entitled, How to Succeed When Others Fail. How do I succeed when others fail? Or you could say, why do some succeed and other people fail? And, and I'm going to put it in the context of the church, the body of Christ, believers, Christians. Why is it that some succeed in their Christian walk and others seemingly fail? Why is it that it seems like some believers, they excel, they grow, they move forward, they're blessed and more blistered? Is that a word, blistered? Uh, blistered or blistered, and others are just stagnant, and they're broke, and they're weak, and they're, 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 they're hurting, and they're all the, why? Why is that? Why can two people go to a church, and one comes out succeeding, and the other one comes out failing in their Christian walk? Putting it in the context of Christianity, okay, the church. We're going to look at that for the rest of this month, and I just want to encourage you, uh, you know, it's summer, and here we are halfway through the year. Can you believe it? Fourth of July is going to be in a couple of weeks, the Fourth of July parade outreach we do every year. And here we are. How are you doing on your New Year's resolutions? You know, we need. Oh, I heard that. I felt that. Praise God. My heart goes out. Amen. But right now is a good time to look, introspect. How are we doing on our New Year's resolutions we made? How are we doing with our one year Bible? How are we doing with our exercise? How are we doing with all that we said we were going to do January 1? It's not a time to be condemned. It's a time to self-evaluate. Where am I? The year's half over. And with that, I want to say, you know, all God's people need vacations. Yeah, I'm for you having a vacation in the summer. I'm for me having one, my family, for you having one. This is not a preacher that's ever going to browbeat the sheep for taking a vacation. But here's the big idea. Don't take a vacation from your faith. You can take a vacation from work and school, but not your faith. And what's so cool now is wherever you're at, all over the world, wherever you're at, maybe Paris, maybe Dubai, wherever you're at, you can still go to church on vacation online or a replay. But, but take your vacation and your pastor's for you doing it. You need it. I need it. But don't take a vacation from your faith. Don't take a vacation from your faith. And I want to give you in this series starting today, I want to help you cause your faith to have a new momentum. I want you to have a new momentum to your faith. I want it to take off a little better, a little faster, excel a little higher, get the drive back, the passion back, mid-year, hot, summer, humid in St. Louis. I want to give you some momentum to your faith. Is that okay? So, so I want you to go to Matthew chapter 7 in your Bible, and I hope you brought your Bible with you, uh, Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to look at that. But, be but before we do, you know, I just, want to, I just want to lay a foundation. The bottom line for the whole rest of the month is why do some Christians succeed when others fail? Why do some people get something out of church when other people get nothing and they think it's boring? Why do some Christians ha have a, a, good, a good attachment and relationship to the Word of God and other Christians don't have any attachment and relationship to the Word of God? So, so I, I want to give you some things that are not going to be on the screen. They're, they're not going to be in the notes. But your faith, number one, I'm going to give you five Ps. Your faith uh, should be your priority. Number one word, your faith and my faith should be our number one priority. Uh, really seriously, before our family, our marriage, our, our health, our money, our job, our career, our friends, our hobby, our vacations that your priority should be your faith. Working on your faith, we building our faith, we empowering our faith, we, we getting new momentum to our faith. So your faith, now I'm giving you the big picture of why church. 
Because there's a lot of people out there today that have been hurt by the church, wounded by the church, mad at the church. I'm talking about the church as a whole. They, they see no need for the church. Since COVID, there's been hundreds of thousands of people who left the church and never came back. And they've been hurt. They've been wounded. They've been upset and bruised. And my heart goes out. And I understand it. But you know what? We've all been hurt by the church. And my dad taught me, Dave, that people are not God. In other words, I keep my eyes on God and not people. You're going to get hurt at Walmart, and you're going to get hurt at the First Church of the Frigidaire. Am I right? You're going to get hurt at the mall, and you're going to get hurt at church, right? Church is to be a lab. Church is to be a lab to learn how to use our faith with one another and get along so we can transport it into the world, right? So the people who are anti-church, you trace it back. It always go back to they were hurt in church. They were wounded by a Christian. Uh, they were hurt by a pastor or a bishop or, or an elder. You can always trace it back. People who are anti-church, who hate the church, don't see a need for the church, don't have time for the church. It always goes back to a bad relationship with the church somewhere growing up. But within the church, the context of the church, I'm dealing with why do some succeed and others fail? What's the defining factor? Well, number one, I have to keep my faith as priority. Uh, number two, I have to make the Bible personal. I have to make the Bible personal. The, the Bible won't work for me if I don't make it personal. I hope you understand what that means. You know, in other words, when I come to church, what is the message going to have for me? What is the message going to say to me today? Not for my husband, my wife, my ex, my peer, my friend, my enemy. Uh, no, no, I have to make the Bible personal. That's why usually we do the exercise, this is my Bible. I, I do that not because John Osteen did it. I do it because I want to make the Bible personal to you every time you come to church. Personal. Until I make it personal, how do I do that? When I come to church, uh, what is the word for me today? It won't work. So I have to make my faith priority. I have to make the Bible personal. And then uh, number three, the Bible has to be practical. And that's what I thank God. And you all pray for me. I know you do. And I can feel it because every time I've been doing this for 40 years, I don't have to study, but I love to study because I want to do my best for you. And I like to take difficult things and break them down and make them simple. It's called practical. Your faith won't grow without practical teaching of the word of God. Your faith won't grow without practical teaching teaching of the Word of God. See, I don't want you to go out for lunch today at, at, at White Castle, and I don't want somebody to say to you, hey, you went to church today? Yeah, I went to my church. What'd you get out of church? Oh, it was good. Oh, it was good. That's not the goal for it to be good, right? Well, I just felt that right there, too, as well. Praise God. So I have to make my faith priority. That's number one in my life. Because you can't walk without faith. You can't get born again without faith. You can't please God without faith. You can't receive from God without faith. You can't overcome without faith. You can't become the husband or the wife or the mother or the father without faith. You can't become the boss without faith. Right? So faith has to be your priority right here in the middle of the summer. And why do some fail? They don't make it priority. Their kids are priority. Sports are priority. Hobbies are priority. Job is priority. They don't make it priority. Number two, we have to make it personal. When I come to church, what is God going to say through the teaching to me today? And then number three, it's got to be practical, practical, practical. So then number four, I can practice it. I have to practice it. Are you with me? I have to practice it. So let me just give you a hint. Uh, I, the test, and I give you the answer, open book test, is this. The difference between why some fail 
and why some succeed. Those who succeed are what we call at Church on the Rock doers of the Word of God. And those what we call a church on the rock that, that are losing are those who hear it but don't practice it. That's the difference. The difference between why some Christians are getting ahead and other Christians are stuck because they're just going to church and it's good. But they're not taking and making it personal, priority, practical, and practicing it. Practicing it. I have to become a doer of the Word of God in order to succeed as a believer, as a Christian. Are you all with me? So then the last is, then now, now that, that I make my faith priority, and now I make the Bible personal, and, and I forgot the third one already. What was it? Uh, practical. And, and then I practice it, right? I practice it. So then now what happens is change in my life, my life getting better, my life turning around, going to a new level becomes possible. Possible. Don't listen to a psychologist or a counselor or a well-meaning friend or a parent or an enemy or a culture tell you you can't change. Don't listen to a counselor or a judge or a lawyer or a psychologist or your ex or your parents or, or, or your friends or your peers tell you you will never change because it's possible for us to change sitting under the teaching of the word of God and then applying it. Can I have an amen today? Come on, let's thank God for the word today. Can we thank him for the word today? Praise God. So, so my question to you is, before we even begin our series, as we lay a foundation, is, is how do you interact with the Bible? How, what's your interaction like? What is, your, what is your interaction with the Bible? Do you see it as, and I'm speaking, you understand I'm speaking to the world. Uh, what is your interaction with the Bible? Uh, 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 you say it's too hard to read. I don't have time to read. It's irrelevant. It doesn't apply today. It's just a history book, Pastor. What is your interaction with the Bible? Because that has a whole lot to do as a Christian. Now, context Christian, between I succeed or fail, go to church and stay the same all my life or go to church and change weekly with my life. What is your interaction with the Bible? Now, maybe you grew up in a certain denomination, your family, where you were, it was, you know, not a good, not a good upbringing, not a good relationship in your family. Maybe you, you said, I was forced to go to church. I was forced to read the Bible. And, and I really just don't like church or the Bible or Christians because the way my parents raised me. I get that. But, but you need to not look at your parents as God or the church as God or Christians as God. They can be a guide, but never make them God. What I'm saying is if you keep God, God, then you'll stay on track. Keep your eyes off people. Yeah. So what is your interaction with the Bible? You know, my first year at college in Waxahachie, Texas, Kim and I, Southwestern University, my, my first semester, my first class was taught by an old missionary, and it was about introduction to the New Testament. And, and the very first class on that fall semester she said, now, boys, ladies, I want you to know this right off the bat, right off the bat. I'll never forget it. This was 1976. I still remember it. Uh, she said, now, I just want you guys to know this right now. On campus, if I walk by your car and I see your Bible in the back window of your car, if I see your Bible uh, laying on the dashboard of your car, you flunked this class. You already flunked it. You see, but he went hard, Pastor. She was hard. No, you know what she's trying to do? Get us to respect, honor, elevate, prize, treasure the Word of God. That was, that's what she was trying to do at the very beginning. She was telling us, you know, if you guys don't uh, honor and respect the Word of God, this class isn't going to help you. If you don't see this as the most important textbook in the world, this isn't going to help you. Wow, never forgot it. 
What is your interaction with the book? Is it once a week, once a month, once every week? Remember now, I'm speaking to the world. Uh, or is it a one-year Bible like here at Church of the Rock? That's what we do daily. Old Testament, New Testament, Psalm and a Proverb, daily. What is your interaction with the Word? That will determine if you succeed, you, you increase, you excel, you go from glory to glory, or you're stagnant all your Christian life and a loser and you get beat up. So what is your interaction with the Word? And, and, and what, are we, what are we going to do with God's Word? What are we doing with God's word? What is your attitude towards God's word? What, what is your attitude towards God's word? When you read your one, your Bible, do you do it intentionally and, and ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? Not my husband or my wife or my mother, my father, my brother, my sister. When I do my one, my Bible, intentionally reading it, God, what are you going to say to how many of y'all, y'all know this? Many times we read our Bible, and then throughout the day, we need what we read. The center section's with me. I don't know about y'all on this side. Come on now. You, you, you read the devotional, or, or, or you read your you know, one-year Bible, or you're reading through a, a book of the Bible, and then throughout the day, you need what you read in facing the giant of that day. How cool is that? That's the Holy Spirit, isn't it? Amen. You know, uh, uh, I've always, and you, you all know it, I, I love the Word of God. You know that. I mean, I love the Word of God. I got that from my mother. You've heard the story. You know, my mother, when I think of my mother, she's in heaven. I remember she always had a devotional, the bread of life, that little bread plastic packet with the scriptures, uh, that loaf of bread. She always had a, a, a daily devotional, and she always had her Bible open on the kitchen table. And it wasn't just there, but, but she was there reading her Bible. My mother gave me my love for the Word of God. Now, I don't know what your parents did, or I don't know what you're doing as a parent for your child. You know, summer blast. I, I don't know if you're showing your children that the Word is priority in their life, but if you haven't, would you start this weekend? If you don't have a good relationship with the Word of God, would you begin to work on interaction, a better relationship, a daily habit? Because I promise you, you go from failing to succeeding, but not overnight, over time. You all with me, everybody? Can, can we have a praise break today? Come on, let's thank God for the Word today. See, what, what you hear on Sunday from me I want you to copy and paste on Monday. I want you to copy it and paste it on Monday. I want you to apply it on Monday, what you learn through here on Sunday. Another question, just to locate a self-aware. I'll never increase my leadership without being self-aware. I'll never get better as a Christian without being self-aware. It's so important that we're constantly aware of our weaknesses and our strengths. So I just want to challenge you with this today. And, and, and again, I'm talking to the world, okay? I want to challenge you today that when you open your Bible, is there still an awe? There should be. Yeah, it's even getting quiet in this church on the rock house. When you open your Bible, there should be an awe. If I've lost my awe from the Word of God, I need to get my awe back. Instead of awe on social media or Facebook or a story or a reel, I should get my awe every time I open the Word of God. I, I should, there should be wonderment, revelation, insight. The light comes on. I see something I never saw before. That's the interaction I have to have with the Word if I, as a Christian, am going to succeed as a parent, as a leader, as an entrepreneur, as an employee, as a student. There has to be that awe in the Word of God. You know, last weekend I had the privilege of a, a God is for you classes, and I get to do the first class. I think we got a picture of the class from, from last week, we took a family picture together. Maybe I'm, I'm asking the guys to, there they are. Look at that. Would you all look at that? Come on, get excited. That's our church family. Wow. And it's the largest class we've ever had in the history of our church going through the God is for you classes. And so I asked them, I asked them, you know, who they are and where they came from and 
Why are they at church on the rock? And why do they want to get out of the classes? And, and all of them said that we want to get out of the class. We want to discover our God-given purpose. They're in the right place. Isn't that our motto? Lead people to a God is for them and help them discover his purpose for them. That's what we do here at Church on the Rock. And, and not just for me, because, you know, we have a teaching staff. We have all the departments. So this isn't just me. The second thing they said, why we've come here is to discover our purpose in the classes. But why we come to this church is the teaching, the practical teaching from every department, the word of God. I love that. Give yourselves a hand clap. I love that. Amen. So, so I have to have, uh, here's another P. I lied. I forgot one. Will you all forgive me? Got to forgive me if you want to go to heaven. You want to go to heaven? Okay. So I forgot this one, but you have to have a position of learning. When, when you come to church, if you're going to get something out of church and, and the teaching of the word, I have to be in a position of learning. Now, you entrepreneurs, you go to motivational talks, you know what this is all about. The, the position of learning, and, and not in our church, but, you know, in a lot of churches, you go there, and that's why I don't go, I don't travel a whole lot. You know, I could go all over the world all the time. I hope you know that. I get invitations for these last 40 years <laughs> all over the world, and, and I very rarely go because y'all spoil me. Y'all spoil me because y'all have that position of learning. I go to some churches, some conferences overseas, and I see, I, I very rarely would see back then the position of learning. Well, what is the position of learning? We teach our staff that they're to sit on the front two rows of this congregation with their family. We tell them that. It's required. Do all of them do it? Not always, but they're working on it because they want a paycheck Thursday. Amen. So we tell them to do that. That's not just to be mean and cruel. They're to be an example of position of learning. Daniel, my son, executive pastor, tells him in staff meetings, guys, have your Bible open, have your notepad, take a pen, and lean forward. What does that mean? You're hungry. You're receptive. You're not scrolling. Just run the camera across the auditorium right now, would you? You're not scrolling. You're not messaging. You're not on your phone. That's not a position of learning. A position of learning is you bring your Bible. You have a notepad. Position of learning is that you don't sit back like this. When you do this, that position is saying, I don't want to be here. Proverbs is all about body language. I don't want to be here. My wife made me come. I don't want to learn anything. I'm not going to learn anything. Amen. You got that right. Or looking around to see who's here like you. Or looking around for a uh, somebody to minister to. That is not a position of learning. And most church people don't understand this. So we're lifelong learners. A position of learning is you're looking straight ahead. Now, you don't have to do this. Don't feel condemned if you don't do this. But, but this is our culture at Church on the Rock. This is the foundation. Now, you don't, you don't have to do that to come here. But you'll get more from me if you do something. So the position of learning is you lean forward, you're taking notes. If you notice, we have guest speakers. I take notes in both services. Why am I doing that? To show the guest speaker that I have a position of learning. I'm not a know-it-all. I don't know it all. I have arrived. So the ushers need a Bible. Uh, the door greeters need a Bible. Those on the dream team, when you sit in the congregation, you need a Bible and a notepad and take notes. That tells me you're learning. You're learning. And if you're not learning, you're losing. You're losing. You're losing ground. You're losing relationship with God. Interaction with the word. He speaks to you through his word. Does that make sense to anybody? Boy, Pastor, would you get on? I'm trying. I'm, I'm really trying. Praise God. How much time? Oh, I don't got much time. Praise God. Time is on my side. Yes, it is. That's the Rolling Stones, y'all. Matthew 7, 24 through 28. And, and we'll read this, and then we'll, we'll pick it up next weekend. Have I helped anybody so far? Really, you should walk away knowing how to get stronger, 
Bottom line, the difference between Christians, context, I'm not talking about sinners or the world or convention, or I'm talking about church folk, between them succeeding and failing, is that one does the word, copy and paste on Monday what they learned on Sunday, and the other doesn't. They just listen, sit there, and leave. That's the difference. Therefore, whoever, here's where we got the name for Church on the Rock. Therefore, whoever hears the sayings of mine, that would be the Bible, and you do them, I will liken them to a successful person who built their house on the rock. Who is successful in the kingdom of God? Those who hear and apply it. Those who hear and do it. Whoa. Boy, I hope I'm helping somebody today. And the storms of life came, the winds blew, the floods came, and beat on that house. But it didn't fall because it had a solid foundation on the rock. What is the rock? Hearing the word and then doing it immediately when you leave church. Then verse 26. But everyone who goes to church and says after church at White Castle with their friends Church was good. That's not the goal for church to be good. The goal is transformation. But everyone who hears the sayings of mine and does not do them is a failure, a foolish person who built their house on the sand. But the same rain, the same flood, the same problems, the same winds blew, beat on that house, and it fell and great was the fall. So what's the difference in the body of Christ between those who excel when the storms come, they're students, they come out better, they come out unshakable, they come out overcoming and better and go, and then those who sit right next to them in church, same storm keeps them out of church, out of the Bible, out of relationship with God, keeps them going and wandering and failing. What's the difference? Not the color of their skin, not their economics, not their education. What's the one and only difference? One hears it and copies and pastes it and does it on Monday. And the other says, just a good another Sunday sermon. Let's go have a party. That's the difference between those who succeed and those who fail. And I'm out of time. I sure love you. I hope I helped you. Oh, I'm excited. I'm excited as the team comes. Are you excited about this series? Man, I'm, we're going to go to a new level together. I promise you this is going to be the best series I've ever taught in 40 years. And if I've added value to you today, would you share it with a friend? Would you do that for me? If I help you with perspective, I help you with healing of past hurts of a church, of a Christian, of an experience, of being told you had to read the Bible when you grew up. I hope all that was was taken off your life today, and you were set free in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. One more time. Father, thank you for the word. Thank you. For, come on, let's praise him. We're going to be a doer of the word, a doer of the word, a doer of the word. Let's make that confession. Say, I am a doer of the word, and I succeed in everything I do. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching this week's message. One way for you to connect here at Church in the Rock is through the God is for you classes. These classes are designed to teach you about the culture, mission, and values of Church in the Rock and about your God-given design. You can take these classes anytime by going to our website at cotr.org slash God is for you. And if you want to know about all the incredible things we have here at Church in the Rock, make sure to visit our website at cotr.org. And never forget, God is for you.